So today's guest is uh, Rachel Sherman. She's a PhD candidate in computer science at the Johns Hopkins University. She does most of her research in the uh, Salzburg lab under Professor Steven Salzburg. She um, analyzes human genomic data and sometimes uh, she drops bombshells that <laughs> disrupt the status quo in, uh, in genomics, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, so much so that I get to read her her work in prominent publications like The Atlantic. So welcome, Rachel. Thanks. Okay. So before we get to the fun science stuff, all right, I usually have my guests uh, give us kind of like a, you know, an intro to their journey through science, all right? So your case is not going to be any different, all right? So start us off with uh, where it started for you. So where did this passion for discovery start and um, if you can just walk us through your progression through your education and through your lab work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I had a really awesome biology teacher in high school. Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to do and I, I had a lot of pretty shitty high school teachers went to not so well funded public high school. <laughs> um, and I took biology, loved it, thought it was really interesting, and decided that I wanted to go to college for biology. Um, and the undergraduate institution I went to, uh, Harvey Mudd College, is really unique in that it's a really small school. It's, it's a tech school, and you are required to take classes in pretty much every science. They have eight majors, and they make you take classes in all of them before you declare. So I went in thinking I was interested in biology and in college I took an intro computer science class. Um, and I really liked it. It felt like puzzle solving, which was always the type of thing I really liked as a kid and growing up. And I, I just really enjoyed the, the like puzzle solving aspect, but I was still really interested in biology. Um, and so I kind of ended up combining those things and being drawn to understanding the biology using uh, computational methods as as kind of a tool to get at that. Oh wow, that's that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Very succinct um, explanation of <laughs> how it all started for you. So the Human Genome Project, right? So let's start with a short history of uh, this monumental project, if I may say, right? So yeah. um, it was first proposed in 1988, I think, by a committee convened by the NIH, which would be the National Institutes uh, of Health and the Department of Energy. So um, I guess after the obligatory political haranguing, right, um, work started in, I think, the 90s, the early 90s, so 1990. And this was done by a congressional homologation, right? So different research groups um, were set up to map the human genome and uh, aggregate data from this process and obviously take account of the social and um, naturally ethical ramifications of a project this big, right? Yeah. So um, I guess um, we did the dogged work uh, by scientists. Uh, we were able to discover 100,000 or so genes. and what, 23 chromosome pairs that are situated on these genes that are situated on, right? And um, 3 billion base pairs from each parent, right? So is that is that a good summary of the Human Genome Project? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so so num number of genes is is more like 20,000, although okay. you're, you're right, that number was kind of much higher in the initial Human Genome Project. We okay. thought a lot of things were genes initially that we've since kind of realized probably aren't. And so that number has oh. actually strangely gone down. down. Wow. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a good summary. Kind of an, another thing I'd add that, yeah. you know, maybe you're going to ask about kind of leads into my work a little. Sure. The, so you, you talked about the Human Genome Project as this big public project, yeah. which it was. Mm -hmm. um, but simultaneously in the 90s, a private company also started working on sequencing the human genome. Wow. Um, and this is important because the, the private effort to sequence the human genome was going really fast. And they were trying to put patents 
on the, the human genes that they were sequencing. And this was really concerning because we'd like this to be public knowledge and available to science. Um, and so it kind of pushed the public efforts to really speed up what they were doing. And there was this kind of race going on between the, pi the private and public efforts to sequence the human genome. Um, and as a result, we got the human genome sequenced all 23 chromosomes, these 3 billion base pairs. We got it sequenced more quickly with the public efforts, um, but perhaps not as effectively, one might say. The, the kind of result of this was that a lot of the sequence that had been done already that started being released was actually from a single individual. And they had initially wanted to sequence about 50 volunteers. They took volunteers from, from upstate New York. They happened to be where they pulled this pool of volunteers from, and there were about 50 people who gave blood uh, to have the, their DNA sequenced. But about 70% of the genome we got out from the public effort is actually DNA sequenced from a single individual. And this was kind of a result of the fact that the public efforts were really trying to quickly get sequence out uh, to get ahead of the private efforts. Interesting, interesting. Well, that was uh, my layman's understanding of the Genome Project. So let's get into the fun stuff, all right? So um, what is genome mapping exactly, right? So um, if we can touch on the kinds of maps we have, so the genetic linkage maps and physical maps, uh, what are those? Yeah, so, so genetic linkage maps is kind of how we initially tried to figure out where genes are on a genome. Um, and I'm not going to get into too much detail on this. It's not really what I focus on. But if you have like measurable traits and you know that these are controlled by a gene, sometimes certain traits are, are often inherited together. And this kind of work was initially done in, in plants and in flies and in, in organisms that aren't humans where you can breed them <laughs> um, and figure out, oh, these two traits maybe you know, eye color and wing size or something in a fly are often inherited together. And so those genes must be really, really close together on the chromosome because this thing happens where the chromosomes from your mom and from your from from each parent um will recombine and they'll little pieces of them will swap. Uh, but the pieces are a certain size. And so you can try to figure out how likely it is that things are close together. And this is genetic linkage mapping. Um, but it only works for genes because you have to have something measurable. You have to have some sort of trait that's, you know, eye color or wing size or whatever in, in these. And you have to be able to, to breed or look at a whole bunch of people and their parents to try to kind of tease these things out. Um, and so the, the Human Genome Project kind of came along when we found another way to start actually looking at the DNA. Um, and being able to actually look at the sequence as opposed to just inferring where things are on the chromosome from patterns of inheritance. And so everything I work with is based on genome sequencing data where we can actually look at the nucleotide bases of the DNA sequence and see where the genes are and see how far, far apart things are um, and try to build out you know, what is the sequence of like a whole chromosome as opposed to just making these inferences about where the genes are. Interesting, interesting. So if we can just take a step back for a minute, right? So you're a computer scientist by training, right? So why genomics, right? Is this just a, a natural progression of how, you know, computer science has its tentacles embedded in every walk of life and you know it just happens to be that okay genomics is the direction you decide to go yeah i mean i i would actually not quite say i'm a computer scientist by training my undergrad okay. major was computational biology which was joint between biology and computer science so mm. i definitely came at computer science as an interesting tool to approach biological problems but a lot of the people i work with are computer scientists by training okay. um and i think it, genomics is there's just so much data now now that we can sequence human genomes it's such a huge amount of data that you really can't it's it's totally impossible to look at it like by eye and make any sense of it 
even with the help of computers, we have a lot of trouble making any sense of it. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's an interesting problem to a lot of us and to a lot of computer scientists because there's just this huge puzzle of there are so many pieces of it. How do we work with and process so much data efficiently? And some people are really interested in that. Are there ways that we can, you know, find patterns computationally that we can't find by eye? I think there are a lot of different problems in computer science that can be applied to genomics. And so it draws a lot of, a lot of different people in different areas of computer science training to try to ta help tackle these problems. Interesting, interesting. So the reference uh, genome, right? So this all started with one person. Now, I know you touched on it uh, a minute ago, but um, can you give us a summary? And um, if you can, who is it attributed to? Just uh, kind of fill us in on this. Uh, work. Yeah. So, so like I mentioned earlier, they yeah. had tried to recruit like about 50 individuals uh, for the Human Genome Project. And we didn't know for a long time who those individuals were. Um, they were anonymous donors from upstate New York because they were from upstate New York. A lot of people assumed that they were white European descended individuals, but we didn't really know this. Um, and then in 2010, some researchers who were working on a, a Neanderthal genome actually did some analysis of the, the human genome that we've come out with. Um, and that analysis showed that the human genome is about 70% from a single individual that was one of these volunteers. Um, it looks like this individual was actually African American um, and that they were like half of European descent and half of African descent. Um, and we, we termed this individual RP11, which was their anonymous identifier that we can kind of track back to the their anonymously donated sequence. Cool. Um, yeah. Other than that, we don't know a whole lot about this, this individual, but, but the genome is mostly made up of their sequence with then kind of a smattering of sequence from the other volunteers for the project. And those volunteers are mostly seems to be of European descent, but there's an Asian individual uh, or, or Asian American individual that was, was also part of that, that other 30% of sequence. Cool, cool. So really, I'm just curious to know, right? I, I just want to get a feel of your resolve, right? So how does someone look at a project as daunting as the human genome reference and say, okay, I want to I wanna parse that, right? So is that just, um, you know, an attribute of having computer science, some computer science training, and that's what we do, right? We like to parse stuff. So is that just, uh, you know, a result of your training as a, a computer programmer? Yeah, um, I mean, I think that uh, I, that's, a, that's a good way of putting it. I think a lot of biologists have like a favorite gene or a favorite uh, like thing that they're interested in that's small scale. And I think one of the biggest differences between a genomics perspective and kind of coming at it from more of a biology perspective is this inclination to like, we have all this data, what can we do with it and try to come at it from, you know, looking at all the data we possibly have. Um, I think for, for me, look, with this project, it was less an interest in, let's see what's missing or what's wrong with the human genome reference, and more that we, we had this really interesting data set um, that I'm, I'm sure I'll get into more in your further questions. We had this really interesting data set of about a thousand individuals of African descent um, and these populations are, are really understudied in genomics. Um, and so we just kind of wanted to look through this data set and really see what we could find that has been missed previously in studying mostly European individuals. So your claim to fame um, was your discovery of missing sequences in the human genome reference, right? Now, this was uh, as a result of you juxtaposing DNA sequences of subjects of African descent to the reference genome, right? Now, can you get into how this was done? And do you remember your, I guess, your visceral reaction to this revelation? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start with how we kind of figured this out. Um, 
I'm going to really briefly kind of talk about how we sequence DNA because that's, that's going to be pretty important here. The, the key thing is that we're not able to like take a whole chromosome and say, here's the sequence of the chromosome end to end. If you're sequencing, say you or me, we can't just say, oh, your chromosome one is all of these bases. What we're able to do is we're able to take DNA, extract it from cells, from blood or saliva or whatever. We chop it up into lots of really, really tiny pieces. And so the whole genome is like 3 billion bases split into 20 pairs of 23 chromosomes. Um, but we're only able to look at these little snapshots of like 150 bases or so at a time is the kind of standard technology. And so because we can't look at the whole thing at once, the way we figure out if my genome looks the same as your genome, looks the same as someone else's, is we figure out where those little 150 base pair pieces go by lining them up to the human reference genome. And so this works fine if we have a 150 base pair piece that maybe has one or two differences in it from the reference genome or between me and you or whoever we're sequencing. Um, we can kind of compare them and say, oh, these look really similar, but they have this one little difference, and we can see what that difference is. But if these pieces are so different that they don't look anything like the reference genome, that poses problems because we, we look at how people differ by, by using this template that we have that, that came out of the Human Genome Project. Um, and so what we decided to do for this project, because we had sequencing from these African descended individuals, was we wanted to look at the big differences. We know how to find these small differences by lining stuff up to the reference genome, but we wanted to try to say, well, what about those pieces that just don't line up at all? What's going on there? Um, and so we did some work to kind of stitch those together. So instead of lining up to the reference genome, you can do what's called assembly. And the, the way we kind of do this to be a little hand washy about, uh, hand wavy about it, is we, we can take these 150 base pair pieces and they actually overlap each other because we have a bunch of copies of the genome and we can try to stitch them together to, to kind of look at what a genome looks like. And this is how we, we initially approached the Human Genome Project, but it's a lot more difficult and more work and less practical. And so now that we have a template, we like to use that template and that's, that's just fine. Um, but we wanted to look at these pieces that were missing. So like you said, we, we ended up finding about 300 million bases, 300 megabases of sequence that's cumulatively over these like almost a thousand individuals. Um, but even so, that's, uh, that's like 10% of the human genome that just wasn't there. Um, my initial reaction was I did something wrong. Um, I was like a second year grad student at this point. I sure. st still felt like I didn't really, I mean, I still sometimes feel like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I think we all do. But yeah. I, I really, uh, I felt like it's I... The, it's I the Dunning-Kruger effect in, uh, you know. <laughs> Full force right there. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I felt like I must have done something wrong. There's no way that we're finding this much extra sequence that's not in the reference genome. And I went to my advisor and yeah. showed him my results. And we said, okay, well, you know, we need to look at, it, look at this really critically because it's a really interesting result. And let's make sure we didn't do anything wrong. And let's make sure it's real. And we went through what I'd done and we... We did end up finding a few places where I'd kind of done small things wrong and it was nerve wracking, like redoing <laughs> them and being yeah. like, is this totally going to change everything? Mm. Um, and it didn't, you know, there were some small things here and there that needed tweaking and we ended up doing a whole lot of different checks to really try to make sure that our, our result was correct. And uh, eventually we, you know, stopped being so surprised and, and kind of, believed that, yeah, it, it's just really a result of how we do our analyses. And because we compare everything to the reference genome, and that's how we do most of the work we do in genomics, that there really is a lot that we miss by, by the way that we do these analyses, typically. That's very interesting. So 300 million base pairs, that's, that's a lot. So do we know if these uh, base pairs encode for 
any sort of proteins, any genes? Because if we're to bring it back to the pandemic, right? So the SARS-CoV-2 virus only has, what, 30,000 base pairs? And that's actually a lot for a virus. And it's and it encodes some very interesting proteins that, you know, are the reason why we're having so much problems with it, right? Very yeah. interesting proteins. So, I mean, I, I can only assume that 300 million base pairs there might be certain proteins or genes that can be gone missing because because uh, hey. we don't know. Yeah, there there might be. So so to, to start with, kind of the the coronavirus comparison. So viruses are are really different than humans genetically, in that viruses and bacteria are pretty much all genes. All but genes, yeah. humans, uh, it's only a couple percent of our genome that's actually genes. So. Yeah. We found a lot of sequence. We expect that a lot of that sequence is is are not going to be genes. They're not. We don't we don't know what a lot of this sequence we found does, and that's that's still something we're looking into. Um, we also, because of the way we found it, don't even know where a lot of it goes in the human genome. We know we have this chunk of sequence that exists in some people, and we're often not even sure right now what chromosome it's on. Um, so there, there's definitely still work to be done. We do think some of these sequences are within genes that we already know about, um, and that might might very much be of interest, but we just don't really know yet. We're currently looking into whether some of these sequences are totally are pieces of or are totally new genes that aren't represented in the human reference genome which isn't to say they're like new genes in a particular person. Probably a lot of these things are in their genes that exist in most people and they just happened to not make it into the human reference genome, whether because this one individual RP11 was missing that gene or just because we didn't do a good job of sequencing. Um, so it's, it, it's a great question. There might be genes that are coding for proteins and that are doing things and having a functional effect. There might be, but we don't really know the extent of it. Interesting, interesting. So some scientists have uh, suggested the idea of doing away with what we have and coming up with a new reference genome, right? Reference uh, sequence. And I guess some have uh, suggested a pan genome. Right. So what does that mean, pangenome? And uh, how do we go about embarking on that journey in a more in a resourceful manner? Right. Because I'm sure these are very resource intensive processes. Yeah. So there there are a lot of different ways to kind of think about what we'd want in in a reference in like a template genome. Um, a lot of scientists talk about you know, maybe we'd uh, I, let's kind of talk in the ideal case about. I would maybe want to compare my genome to a really close relative of mine. If I maybe develop some disease and we want to know what's causing it, if I take a healthy relative and I could compare my genome to theirs, then there's kind of going to be a lot less noise that's just difference between me and my relative because we're really genetically similar. And so maybe the differences we do see are what's causing you know, whatever disease or, or thing that I'm trying to figure out. Um, so to kind of extend that, because it's right now not feasible to have the genome sequence of my close relative, uh, people have been talking about the idea of population references. So maybe I, I'm, I'm Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Maybe there's some sort of reference genome for an Ashkenazi Jew that I could compare to uh, maybe, you know, if you're, and, and we have some of these already, there are, this is a genome that just came out. There's a, a Chinese and a Korean reference genome, and there are a lot of other countries working on different population specific genomes. And so maybe you'd compare to your population. The idea of a pan genome is that we have some sort of structure that kind of combines all these things. It represents all of the differences between people we've sequenced between different populations and that you could do some sort of comparison to everything at once instead of maybe having to pick. And this might be especially helpful if you're of really mixed ancestry, right? Like maybe if you're of mixed ancestry, you don't know, even if you have these population references, 
<laughs> which one do you choose? Um, and so having kind of all of the information together where you can say, how does my genome line up or differ from all of the genomes that we've ever sequenced before would be really useful. Uh, but it is a really daunting computational task. And it's one that we have, we have enough trouble comparing to the reference genome as is. It takes a lot of computational resources and, and time to compare a lot of genomes to a single reference genome. And once you start adding in sequence from every individual that we've ever looked at, uh, you need to figure out how to make that tractable, and we're not there yet. Okay. So, yeah, like you said, the pan-African contiguous sequences were compared to sequences from other uh, ethnicities, right? So Chinese, Korean. So um, did we find anything interesting by that, by doing that comparison? So, so, yeah. So what we found in that comparison is that a lot of the sequences we're finding in these African ancestry individuals, um, we are also seeing in the sequenced Chinese genome and the sequenced Korean genome that we have available. Um, I wouldn't say this is interesting from like a population or ethnicity kind of standpoint at all. I think what it's really probably telling us is that these sequences are common. We see them in a lot of people. It's not just that we see them in African ancestry individuals, which is what we were looking at, but we see them in a, a lot of individuals across populations. And they're just sequences that aren't in the reference genome. Um, and we, we kind of partic we particularly looked at the Chinese and Korean genomes because they're available and there's not a whole lot that is available that's non-European. Um, but I, I, think, I think it really just kind of hits the point home that we're missing a lot, no matter, no matter who you look at. The reference genome is really only representing one person, um, and it's not representing any particular population. It's, it's really just, it's representing a single individual, and genetically, we're all really different. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So this reminds me, um, a few weeks back, I spoke to a researcher at uh, the Broad Institute. So her and her collaborators, uh, discovered this toxin in the Burkholderia sinocepatia uh, pathogen, the bacteria, right? So this bacteria is the same one that causes a comorbidity in um, pe people with uh, cystic fibrosis, right? So this toxin, which they call the uh, double-stranded DNA deaminase A, if I remember that correctly. So a deaminase is, uh, so that takes out a, amino group from a molecule, right, if, if I remember that correctly. So using that toxin with the zinc finger nuclease, right, they, are able to, they were able to um, share or snip um, DNA in, in uh, the mitochondria, right? So they were the first group to actually come up with that technology. So we can do, we can do CRISPR technology on DNA in the cell nucleus, right? But they actually discovered this new technology to actually snip DNA in the mitochondria. Now she was, cause I was perplexed and I was, I was trying to figure out how do you find something like this, right? So I guess with uh, the help of collaborators at Washington University, they were able to pr predict or project where they could actually find this, this uh, toxin, right? So it's it's kind of like the allegory of the guy that lost his keys and he's like looking under a you know a light post and someone walks up to him okay what are you looking for and he's like yeah i'm looking for my keys and they're like okay did you lose it here and he's like no not really but this is the only place where there's light <laughs> right so it brings me back to what you're saying the obstacles of collating a pan genome is almost self evident right so are there any mechanisms or technologies that could direct researchers to, I guess, certain sequences that might be missing and that could actually help us? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that's to, to some extent what we were trying to do here by very specifically saying, well, let's look at the things that don't line up to the reference genome. But we still have these problems of these sequences that we found because of the 
because we looked at them in relation to what's not in the reference genome. Mm. We don't know what they are, where they go, all of these sorts of questions. I mean, ideally, we'd really like to be able to kind of take that spotlight right in and shine, take like flashlight and shine it over the whole genome and yeah. figure out Would it be uh, nice? how to do that. And we're, we're getting there. So, you know, I, I talked about all of these problems kind of come from the fact that we can only sequence the short little bits at a time. And if we could just sequence the whole chromosome at once, like that'd be really great. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're getting closer. So there are newer technologies where we can sequence tens, even sometimes up to hundreds of thousands of bases in a row at a time. And these new technologies have their caveats and they're more expensive and they're a little bit higher error, but we're, we're making progress. We're trying to really see if we can get to a point of just here's the whole chromosome sequence all at once and try to avoid some of these pitfalls. Cool, cool. So um, I'm curious to know, what are core genomes and dispensable genomes and how do they differ from a pan genome? Do we know? Yeah, so so core core and dispensable genomes are just kind of these terms that really originated with bacteria but are starting to be applied in other areas to like what genes are common and what genes are are not. So a core genome refers to like this is the sequence that everyone in the species has. So if we're talking about humans, all humans have these genes. We've never seen a human without these genes. It seems like you probably need them to function. And that's probably a good chunk of the genome and probably m most of the genes, but we we honestly really don't know for humans. <laughs> um, and uh, dispensable genomes are, here's a piece of the genome that you clearly, not everyone in the species needs. Some people have it, some people don't have it. It's, it's dispensable because you can survive just fine and everything's fine and you're a normal functioning human, uh, even if you don't have these genes or this, this genome sequence. Um, the pan genome is is the combination of the core and dispensable genome. So we'd like to know everything. What is everything that any for humans, any human could possibly have? All of the stuff that is in everyone, plus all of the stuff that is only in some people. Wow, interesting. So, um, according to one of your papers, right? There's um, I guess a bit of disagreement on what's considered uh, a novel sequence. And uh, this got me thinking now, this might be a stupid question, right? But uh, what is a, when is a sequence considered novel and when is a sequence uh, considered, let's say, a mutation? <laughs> you know, I don't know if, that's, if that makes sense at all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what is novel is a really debated question. So a lot of the human genome especially is what we call repetitive sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the sequences we found that make up these 300 million sequences that aren't in the reference are, are what we call these kind of re repetitive sequences. So they look similar to things that are kind of elsewhere in the genome, but we, ha we had to kind of pick a threshold and we said, well, it's less than 90% similar on a like comparison base to base level from other stuff that's in the genome. And so we're going to say it's novel because it doesn't line up, you know, nicely. It's not the same as the stuff that's in the reference genome, but it's kind of like a variation on it. Um, and there's a lot of debate about w how much variance is needed to consider something novel and can it be, repetitive at all or can it be low complexity is is a term we use when so there are four nucleotide bases and sometimes right. sequences will only have like two of them like it'll be a bunch of two of the bases in a row uh or a single a long stretch of a single base and we refer to these things as low complexity and some people will say that anything low complexity they don't consider novel um so it's it's definitely a hard question. As far as mutations, um, I mean, mutations are, are more about the mechanism. So 
we can talk about kind of how these sequences arose and some of them maybe arose from at different points in time and in populations on from different bases mutating over time. Uh, but also some of these sequences we found are, are probably ancestral and maybe we'd consider the things in the reference genome to be the mutation because again, it's only representing one person. So it, it's a little bit harder to talk about mutation because it's talking about the mechanism rather than just kind of what we see. And we don't really know the like evolutionary history of, of a lot of the sequence. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, talking about mutations and um, yeah, it just brings me back to my conversation with that uh, young researcher. I, I suggest you actually look into her work, right? So what they did again with this toxin, it was pretty, pretty awesome. So um, for mutations, right? in the mitochondria just by deaminizing um, um, cytosine, right? So the nucleotide cytosine, if it's, if it's deaminated, it could actually, it becomes uracil. And I guess um, proofreading enzymes like uh, uh, polymerases actually see uracil as thymine, right? So you could actually do a, a switch just by deaminizing cytosine. But yeah, just a side note. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Things like that just really fascinate me. Yeah, right. there. I mean, there there are a lot of different mechanisms, kind of, yeah. by which these mutations happen. Yeah. Um, and just we, you know, our cells are constantly copying DNA over and over, and That's right. every time, you know, there are little kind of mistakes, and they yes. accumulate over time, yeah. and. Yeah. So the benefits of uh, a pan genome in plants is kind of obvious, right? So resistance to disease, better yield. So besides the merits of disease mitigation, do we know of any other benefits that, you know, pan genomics uh, present for human beings? I mean, I, you know, I think I, that's definitely the, the big one kind of on, on two fronts, both finding genetic causes of diseases that we maybe don't don't know we think they're genetic but we don't have a cause for and also for kind of more personalized disease treatments potentially um i mean outside of that i wouldn't say there are any kind of like obvious benefits but i think that's that's a lot of science right like there aren't necessarily obvious benefits, but we want to understand more about ourselves. And sometimes that leads to benefits that we, you know, hadn't hadn't thought of previously. Um, we kind of now are just starting to have this ability to like read the genome almost. And genomics is really kind of in its infancy. We can we can read the genome, sort of, not even if in its entirety. Uh, but that really doesn't mean that we have much of an understanding of most of it. Um, and I think, like a lot of science, you know, we don't necessarily see a benefit of, of developing that understanding. But maybe once we develop more of an understanding, uh, it'll be clear how we can use that to, to help people. <laughs> I know most of your recent work is on breast cancer research, right? And um, I think we share something in common in that regard ourselves, right? Because um, I just joined a new lab and uh, what we do is we, we look at, we analyze histological images, right? Using machine learning, right? To look at breast cancer um, tissue, right? So... Can you talk about the intersection between breast cancer research and what you've done previously? Yeah, so um, the the kind of overarching thing in my research, I would say, is looking for large variation between individuals. So not these little things that are easy to find by lining up to the reference genome, but these large kind of missing sequences or, or larger things that are actually harder to detect because we do this kind of lining up to the reference genome. So my work in breast cancer has been similarly to look for these large variations between people, um, although instead of looking between you know people of different 
ancestries or people in, in the reference genome looking at differences in uh, people who have, have breast cancer and trying to see how can we use kind of the same techniques or new technologies. So we're using some of these technologies where we can sequence much, much longer pieces at once to try to look for these large regions of difference. Um, the kind of rationale being that we've done a lot of work looking at small differences in breast cancer, and we have found some markers and things that do seem to contribute, but it's certainly by no means a you know, solved disease, even the, the breast cancers that seem very, very hereditary. Um, and so maybe if we look at these larger chunks of sequence that are, are missing or harder to find, harder to look at, maybe we'll find something there. Okay, cool, cool. So I'd like to talk to you about ancestry companies, right? So companies like 23andMe. Now, if I was to give them any sort of advice, maybe like their ad, you know, division, right? I'd say they should actually stress more, you know, this idea that we're, they're bringing humanity close to, together, right? Because whenever my friends, they do like their 23andMe and they happen to see, you know, that they have 1% Nigerian or this and that, they'll call me right away and let me know that, oh, okay, well, I'm actually related to you in some way, you know, and I'm pretty sure for maybe their friends that are Filipino or you get what I'm saying, they would do the same thing too, right? So if anything, I think this technology is, you know, it could actually help us solve some of our social and, um, you know, ethnic ills that kind of are going around in the country and, you know, in a broader aspect of the world, right? So now it seems that to me, at least, gene-based tailor-fitted medicine is just the natural progression of medicine, right? So what role do you suspect companies like 23andMe, right, can play in, uh, in the future of personalized medicine? Yeah. Uh, first off, I think that's a really awesome way of, of yeah. thinking about these, yeah. these companies. Uh, yeah. And I wish <laughs> whenever I see their ads, they don't even, they don't touch that. And I'm like, that's like the most important thing. If, if you ask me when it comes to people finding out, you know, where they come from, you know, in yeah. a way it's just, it's almost self, it's, it's obvious to me. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yeah. what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, on the, yeah, on the medical side of things, yeah. um, I mean, I hope that companies like this will kind of step up to help fill that niche right now. They're, they're kind of filled by, by a different set of companies that are less in the consumer awareness. So there are these companies like 23andMe and Ancestry mm -hmm. um, that are sequencing. They're actually looking at a very, very small percentage of the genome. They're only looking at markers where we, we know at that particular base in the genome it you know, means something or it's associated with something. If you have a certain base there, uh, you know, you're likely, more likely of this ancestry or you're more likely to have this eye color or you know, all the different fun traits that they tell you about. You, you know, the cilantro tastes like soap or whatever, <laughs> different, different traits. But there are these sites where we, we kind of already know things. Um, whereas there are other companies that are doing genome sequencing for, for clinical diagnostics. Um, Foundation One is one of the big ones. There's one here in Baltimore called Personal Genome Diagnostics. Um, there, there are many more. And they're, they're definitely like sep very kind of separate industries right now. Um, I mean, I think it'd be great if they could kind of merge together because I think the companies like 23andMe and Ancestry, they're getting people excited about genome sequencing and excited about genomics and excited about learning about themselves. Um, whereas these other companies, people have never heard of them unless you have a rare disease, unless you have cancer and you're trying to use genome sequencing in the medical realm. Um, and I think it'd, it'd be really great if we could see kind of more of a consumer-based, uh, you know, looking at your, your medical information genomically and having that available so it's, it's not necessarily a thing we only do once you're sick. Um, if we can do this kind of in a preventative way, I, I hope that we'll move towards that and I hope these companies will move towards that. Um, that said, it's also a very different ethical <laughs> 
thing, right? 23andMe and Ancestry, uh, they actually don't report a lot of known markers that are disease related for ethical, you know, reasons. They don't want to freak people out when, you know, maybe there's only a really small likelihood they're going to get some disease based on their genetics and, and interpreting those results can be hard. And so I think that's also something we, we really need to consider if these consumer companies are going to move forward in the medical realm. Interesting. So, I mean, do you think, um, do we share the same sentiment on this or am I just being overly sanguine on, you know, having personalized medicine be the future, right? And have genomics actually facilitate that process, right? So it's just as easy as us going to the hospital and checking our, you know, our sequences and they can actually tell us that, okay, this medication has a propensity for side effects because of your genes and so on and so on. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I I think that we'll get there, but I think it's farther off than a lot of people think, think or feel like it is. Right. Um, you know, we're we're kind of starting to get there, but only for very very specific applications where like we've studied there's some gene or some sequence we kind of have started to know a lot more about and we really haven't haven't done that on a genome wide level and a lot of things are much more complex than a single gene or a single trait. And I think, uh, I, I hope that this is the future, but I think it's a long ways off. I think it'll be a slow process of, you know, there are certain diseases, certain things that maybe we can use genomics for, but it's going to be a long time, I think, before we can kind of utilize this information across the board just because we're like I said we're just starting to learn how to read the genome and reading off letters is really different from understanding what they mean okay so well at least for now right on a academic scale what do you think these companies can do to help you know researchers like you actualize your your goal of maybe a pan genome I would love to see more of a push from commercial companies um, to ask people if they're willing to share their data for scientific research. So some of the companies do this, like you can check a box that you're willing to let them use data for research, but it's, it's their own internal research that you're, you're authorizing. Um, and, and while this research can certainly produce useful benefits, I'd love to see more of a culture of, of data sharing between the scientific research community and these companies. And that does require more work on the end of making sure that, you know, we're protecting consumers and that they know where their data is going and that they're fully consented and okay with it and they understand the implications of their data being shared with the scientific community. But for people who are willing to share their their genomic data to contribute to science, I'd love to see more collaboration with companies on this front. Okay. Well, that's awesome. So, Rachel, I'd say, um, you know, if we were to wrap this up now, obviously, the question I'd want to ask you is, you know, the ethics of all this, right? So if you get that call at 2 a.m. in the morning, right? If I was to use a political reference, right? You know, politicians like saying that. If you get that call at 2 a.m., this and that. All right. So what what keeps you up at night, right? So this impending popularity of gene-based medicine, what's what are the ethical questions that you feel the ramifications are worth dwelling on? Um all right. I, I think there are two two big things. The first one for me is healthcare. Um, and we're not at a point, I think people are really worried about genomic privacy at a in a place where we're actually like not really there yet. Yeah. It's hard to worry about privacy when you can't really gain much information from someone's genome right now. But in the future we'll be able to get more information from it. And I do worry about discrimination from like insurance and healthcare based on your genome sequence. Um, And this is something that's being discussed politically. But I mean, you know, this, this is also kind of getting, getting political, right? I think that healthcare is a right. And so I don't think that healthcare providers should be able to discriminate based on anything. (laughs) Um, But there are concerns that, you know, they might discriminate coverage uh, 
based on your genome sequence. And I think that's a huge concern. Um, I mean, the, the other, you know, thing that people like to talk about is genome editing. Um, and that's not, I love totally... talking about, <laughs> I, oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge concern. It's a huge yeah. ethical concern. I mean, we've yeah. seen concerns with that in the past couple of years of oh, scientists yeah. deciding that they know best. And that's obviously a huge problem, though a little bit outside of the realm of what I do per se. But the more we learn about the genome and the more I do the work I do, the more information there is available for people who are doing genome editing to decide they want to try to take things into their own hands. And I think we do need to figure out how to get a better handle on that than we've had recently. Here, 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 here. Well said. <laughs> well said, Rachel. Thank you. So um, I'd say that's that's all I have for today, Rachel. So, I mean, if anyone wants to get a hold of you, if they want to read your papers, if they find this illuminating and, you know, uh, you know, they you put that fire under their you know backside and they actually want to pursue uh, geno genomics, they want to pursue computer science. How can they get a hold of you or get a hold of your work? Yeah, um, people should always feel free to, to contact me. My email is rsherman at jhu.edu. I'm on Twitter at rshermanjhu, and people can feel free to tweet me. Uh, always, always happy to chat about science. My papers, some of them are available open access. The ones that aren't, I am always happy to send people most scientists are always, we're always happy to share our papers, even if the journals put them under restriction. Wow. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, people should feel free to get in touch with me. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, that makes me feel warm inside because that's why I'm actually doing this podcast, right? Because I feel this information is important and we need to disseminate information better as scientists. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, it's just these little steps that we can take to actually bring that into fruition right rachel yeah all right again thank you this was awesome i knew it was going to be great but you know this is just the cherry on top yeah it's thank been you, so rachel. great talking to you thanks so much awesome. for having me thank you